A warm welcome to you all um, on, on this warm day for a change. Um, welcome to this um, Independent Commission on Multilateralism Public Consultation on Armed Conflict, Mediation, Conciliation, Peacekeeping. My name is Yusuf Mahmoud. I'm a senior advisor here at IPI. Before the, addressing the matter that brought us together, allow me to say a few words of uh, background on the Independent Commission on Multilateralism, the ICM. The ICM was launched in the fall of 2014 to provide policy recommendations across 16 issue areas for the consideration of the next Secretary General. You can see these uh, issue areas on the screen on my right. Um, the main purpose of this uh, public consultation, like the preceding ones, is to generate uh, critical feedback from you on the recommendations contained in the issue paper. Uh, feedback received today and online will inform the ultimate shape of the paper on the subject matter under hand. Today's paper is the last listed to be subject of a public consultation. Just a few words uh, by way of introducing, introducing it. Um, in formulating the, the recommendations for this paper, the authors were mindful um, of two or three, three challenges. The, the first one is putting under one chapeau three complex policy issues. Um, mediation, conciliation, and peacekeeping. Second, um, is there was the challenge of how to adapt uh, rather state-centric conflict resolution frameworks and tools to the changing complex multi-stakeholder peace and security environment without straying too far from the spirit and the letter of the charter. The third challenge is how to help ensure that by addressing policy and efficiency gaps that have been outlined in the paper, the recommendations do not lose sight that the ultimate aim of prevention, peace building, peacekeeping, in addition to their immediate effect, is to lay the foundation for self-sustainable peace. And with that, I would like to pass the floor to the uh, panelists whose bio you have uh, with you to offer their uh, reflections on the recommendation on this discussion paper and help us generate an interactive conversation with all of you. Most of those uh, sitting with me here uh, participated in a related retreat of expert that took place last March. So we are very pleased to benefit from their insights again. Each discussant was asked to speak for about four minutes before opening up the floor to you for your thoughts and feedback. For colleagues joining us online, please follow us through our webcast on the ICM homepage, ICM 2016 org. We encourage you to tweet in your comments using hash. Is that hash? I can't. Is that hash with hashtag? I can't even spell the word tweet, let alone um, hashtag ICM 2016 or email media at ipins.org with sustaining peace in the title as seen on the slide. And um, 
I'm going to go a little bit against the order of speakers that you see on your program and start with giving the floor to uh, my uh, colleague, Mr. Arthur Butelis, uh, Director, Center for Peace Operation here at IPI, in order to walk us through the recommendations to uh, refresh your memory. After that, I will um, ask um, uh, my friend and colleague to my left, Maria Machita, to go next. And then we'll take another man, and then finally a woman. So that's how my logic go works. So without further ado, I'd like to give the floor to Arthur. Thank you very much, Yusuf, and uh, good afternoon to uh, everyone. So I've been asked as uh, one of the co-authors uh, of the paper, uh, background paper before you uh, to basically focus my remarks on the recommendations part uh, at the end of the paper. Uh, so let me first start by uh, putting uh, this paper in the context of the three reviews, three major reviews on peace and security uh, that took place in 2015, uh, which have been discussed at length across the street and uh, in this very room as well, uh, including during the recent 10-11 of uh, May high-level debate, uh, indeed. And uh, it is no easy task uh, to come up with good and original new recommendations uh, in this area of peace and security, uh, when the three reviews uh, of peace operations, peace building architecture, and women, peace and security, have already produced over 300 recommendations, uh, as you will recall. So what this ICM paper does, instead of simply restating some of these recommendations, is that it assesses some of the key recommendations among these, as well as the challenges facing the multilateral system in relations to mediation, peace building, peace operations, and make recommendations both on how to adapt the existing UN tools, where and when they can be adapted indeed, uh, but also, and most importantly maybe, puts forward recommendations for how to promote uh, new frameworks, approaches across the UN silos, which you uh, started alluding to in the, uh, in the opening. Uh, I must also say in introduction that uh, what I will now present, while I will now present, comes out of a retreat held at Green Tree at the end of March, uh, which the discussions uh, today took part in. Uh, some of the recommendations, uh, some recommendations in general may be missing or some may need to be updated. Um, and we do recognize this, this is still work in progress. Uh, so we welcome very much your suggestions on both how to improve these recommendations and, and, uh, and if you have any ideas for additional recommendations as well, uh, these are welcome. So first, uh, uh, the first point is about uh, moving the recommendation made by the three reviews uh, for a greater focus on prevention to move it from rhetoric to practice. To do so, the paper suggests that the next PGA, President of the General Assembly, uh, together with the next SG, with the help of independent experts, organize a leaders' summit to launch the process of developing a global agenda on prevention as a national governance and development priority. Basically, reframing prevention as both a national priority and core function of the work of the UN, with a greater focus on the factors associated with peaceful and just societies rather than only focusing on the drivers of conflict. As uh, Youssef you may have here uh, heard him say before, basically freeing prevention uh, from conflict. Uh, the key here, of course, uh, will not be the summit itself, uh, but rather the preparatory work uh, and the commitment of member states leading uh, to this summit. Uh, second point, uh, the paper that said recognizes also that not all conflicts can and will be prevented and resolved, and there's therefore a need uh, for existing UN conflict prevention and mediation tools to also be adapted to the changing nature of conflict. To this end, the paper recommends that the Department of Political Affairs re-examines the state-centric foundational assumption on which recent normative advances and mediations have been built, and that DPA also supports the UN system in devising practical programming modalities for helping member states integrate prevention and mediation as national government and development function, uh, so that in order to sustain uh, peace indeed and, and build resilience and basically national, local uh, capacities uh, for mediation and prevention. Third point, uh, in light of the recent uh, identical GA and Security Council resolutions on the peace building architecture, on, on sustaining peace, 
uh, the ICM paper recommends that the chair of the Peacebuilding Commission supports the setting up of a member state-led structure uh, of sort to engage uh, the next HG and develop a roadmap for implementing this new identical resolution by the 72nd uh, session of the General Assembly. Uh, and that includes modalities for predictable, sustainable financing of peace building and mediation activities. Now moving on to peace operations, uh, the paper recommends that the next SG appoints a small team within the executive office, within his executive office, uh, to propose in consultation with member states through both formal and informal dialogue, a detailed five-year plan on ways to carry forward those HIPO recommendations that were not taken up by the current SG, uh, or which member states uh, remain undecided un, uh, on. Uh, so the, these include, and I have five points here, the first two uh, are uh, recommendations from the HIPO uh, that the SG explicitly left to his, uh, to his or her successor. Uh, first one is restructuring the secretary entities entrusted with peace and security agendas, and the second is the financing uh, of UN peace operations, whether peacekeeping or special political missions uh, under a single peace operations account to facilitate tailored responses, uh, but also the financing of Security Council authorized uh, AU peace support missions from SS contributions. Uh, the third point is about uh, one of the important recommendations we thought to highlight was the selection, preparation, and managing of performance and overall accountability of leadership teams of peace operations. Uh, these include SRSGs, of course, deputies, uh, force uh, commanders with due regard, uh, regard for gender equality. Uh, fourth point is uh, rethinking UN administrative and budgetary decision making in light of HIPO recommendation for more field focus and people-centered operations, able to deliver their mandate more effectively and more efficiently on the ground. And lastly, revisiting the issue of protection of civilian, uh, including the tension between short-term physical protection and longer-term political strategies, as well as further exploring uh, the point raised by the HIPPO uh, about unarmed uh, protection of civilians. Now, turning to member states, the paper suggests that those member states that have short commitment, that have championed, uh, started to champion prevention, mediation, peace building, peace operations, and champion more broadly keeping the spirit of these reviews alive uh, in general, should carry forward the momentum for change during this transition phase of the rest of the year and beyond and build on emerging consensus and points of commonality by forming group of friends around specific proposals or bundles of proposals. Uh, for instance, AU-UN partnerships and financing, or turning prevention into practice, uh, field support, et cetera, et cetera. Lastly, in a shameless plug uh, to us, uh, think tanks and researchers, uh, research institutes, uh, the paper recognizes that some of the above issues, uh, for instance, field-focused and people-centered uh, operations, as well as other issues that may not have been taken up or adequately thought through, by the 2015 reviews, for instance, the issue of prevention of violent extremism, uh, would benefit from further research uh, and policy debates. And, uh, and we do volunteer, I think, as well. <laughs> Thank you, Arthur, for walking us uh, through the recommendations of the paper. And now I'd like to give the floor to my colleague and friend, uh, Mari. You have the floor, Mari. Thank you very much, uh, Yusuf, uh, for this introduction, and Arthur and co-authors uh, for this really uh, excellent paper that, uh, that we have all in front of us, and of course, all the recommendations that come through. As practitioners and those of us who work at the UN, we, we do feel the privilege that we actually are spending day and night uh, working on peace and security, but we also need these moments to, to be reminded by all of you who take a step aside and, and uh, look at what are the sort of the contexts and what, what is this all for. And I particularly appreciate the conceptual framework that you, that you presented and, and uh, how the end goal debate was in the paper. So um, I, I will perhaps make reference to that also as, as, I, as I go along. 
I wanted to just illustrate a little bit peace building in action uh, through a couple of examples because we are all very excited that peace building and sustaining peace has now been accepted through the identical resolutions that you mentioned and we really think there is a momentum to, to really implement uh, sustainable peace. Through a, new, through a new approach. And so we are very excited, we are very eager to move ahead, but we also are very aware of uh, the challenges ahead. So just, just for those of you who don't, don't really cannot uh, picture what is really peace building, a couple of illustrations, and Tatiana can probably help even more. Um, in the paper also, you mentioned a big failure of uh, peace building and prevention activities collectively in the Central Afri African Republic. And I think we all collectively agree on that. Uh, it, in 2013, it is when uh, the country really relapsed into, into conflict. But this was against the backdrop of always uh, the international community emphasizing the importance of prevention. But if you look at, uh, at the funds that go into prevention, in 2002, there was a peace building support office that had a small budget of $2 million that was uh, helping the country trying to uh, sustain its peace. Over the years, the money that went into peace building activities grew from 1 million. In 2004, it was nine. In 2010, it was about 30 million. In 2013, uh, it was the relapse into conflict. Over 30 reports from the Secretary General and that office, uh, and over 10 years of continued call of need to invest into peace, it relapsed. And today we have a $1 billion peacekeeping uh, operation. And that's, that's just one of those figures that we have. Today, of course, it's a peacekeeping operation. We focus a lot our activities on uh, security sector. Uh, there were critical moments where peace building intervention in supporting uh, the payment of um, uh, police and civil servants uh, helped the country to continue its transition and move into what we have today, a new uh, elected government. Now, is this end goal, is, are we talking about stability or are we talking about a new liberal government, as you mentioned in your paper? That's my question that I leave. Another quick uh, example was in Guinea. This country in 2008 had a military coup and uh, in 2010 had uh, peaceful elections. The president committed very much uh, into security sector reform. We, through, through the peace building uh, uh, fund that we have, we decided to invest into uh, taking a census of the military investing about 15%, uh, uh, investing into paying about 15% uh, of the military's early retirement. And this was the start of a very successful security sector reform. So here again, money was put in. It's really not a huge amount of money, but it kick-started a process that contributes to some kind of stability in the country. Now, here, is it again stability? Are we talking about, is it good governance? Are we looking at, into just and peaceful societies? Is it a question of sequencing? And what is our role, our collective role in that? Last quick example is Sri Lanka. Uh, in 2009, it ended its 30-year uh, conflict. But it was not until 2015, uh, with an election of a new government, that the UN constructively started to engage uh, in peace building discussions and activities. Now we are starting to invest into a credible transitional justice, national reconciliation, uh, resettlement assistance, and so on, and uh, looking for medium-term investment into all these areas. All of this happens in close uh, discussion with the government, stakeholders on the ground, including civil society. End goal, is it a just and peaceful society? And I come back to this because this is how the debate started, and I think it's an important end goal discussion to always keep on remembering. Who, what are we doing this for and who are we doing this for? So uh, talking about what, what is being uh, suggested also through our own review and the recent resolution that was adopted, um, and fully acknowledging the shortcomings uh, of our own uh, attempts into peace building activities. And I think in the paper it was said that peace building activities remained fragmented and insignificant. Taking that, uh, where are we today? The Peace Building Commission has now been given a new uh, space uh, through the resolutions, uh, and it has been called to become more flexible. And in fact, this Peace Building Commission that used to only look at six countries now has expanded uh, its discussion into much broader issues, such as financing for peace, looking at countries in transition that come on, on their own. Uh, and youth and gender. And again, this is with the participation of civil society uh, representatives. We have uh, discussed 
common uh, threats or opportunities for peace building in West Africa. So a regional approach looking into what are the common challenges and what are the roles of the various actors that can help. Uh, youth and women in peace. Uh, you may know that last year a very uh, important resolution was passed recognizing the role of the youth as peace builder and champions for peace. So how do we integrate their activities into our, our work? In fact, uh, this, uh, this month for the first time, uh, we are calling proposals directly from uh, civil societies to apply to the peace building fund for empowering youth and women directly. So this is a, a new, uh, a very exciting thing that we are we're doing. Of course, we're doing it uh, starting with uh, select countries, but this information will be available on our website. We have looked at cross-border issues. Uh, this is also not so easy because peace building, when we talk about anything in terms of supporting peace, it is, like you say, state-centric in many times, and it requires a counterpart government. How do we address issues uh, at, at volatile borders, and we are starting to do that uh, for the first time in Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. So we have done a number of new things. Uh, we are trying to implement what has been given to us as a challenge. What remains definitely as a biggest challenge is, of course, how do we bridge Play, how does the Peace Building Commission, uh, that is the subsidiary organ to the General Assembly and Security Council, how does it play that bridging role and this constructive advisory role uh, in, in real terms, not just in terms of statements, but really implementing and impacting uh, change in terms of how we then uh, design peace operations and how we draw them down and how we withdraw. How do we do that? So, uh, commenting on the recommendations, I, I, I fully agree with the, with the recommendations that were just elaborated, but I would, would highlight two things in particular, and this is the leadership question. And I would start definitely with our own leadership. The new Secretary General at that level has to put sustaining peace as a priority for the UN system. And I think we all believe in that, and we, we are looking for that leadership to, to really come from the top. But that's not enough. We need the leadership from the UN side at the country level as well. For our UN representatives, be it peacekeeping operations, uh, political missions, even our own country teams that are headed by resident coordinators, they have to have the leadership to look at peace challenges and peace building opportunities and make it a core and priority function of the team. It requires some courage, it, it requires innovation, but by, by far it requires that political support from our own organization, but also from member states. And this certainly will be a challenge, uh, and these discussions will be already ongoing in, uh, in, the, in the Economic and Social Council and the upcoming uh, QCPR, which is very difficult to pronounce, but I hope you know what, <laughs> what it stands for, Quadrennial Review, let me say it that much. Second point is how do we make peace building and peace significant all the activities we do, uh, be it peace operations or what we call peace building activities. Our peace building activities, the way we are, the architecture is, it, what I've emphasized before, is very inclusive. It, it, we engage with the government, of course, at the state level. We engage with uh, civil society stakeholders. We engage with the country, UN country team and others who implement uh, priority issues. But how do we then make sure that these uh, peace building activities then uh, have a ripple effect and connect back to the larger peace and sustainable peace of the country. This uh, is, I think, a, a, a big uh, challenge, uh, and we have to still work together with our partners, um, be it the regional organization or be it the World Bank or our own UN system. Uh, we have to find the connecting dots, how to connect the dots. And again, I think it goes back to the end goal vision. What's our end goal? Is it stability? Is it building the building blocks for peace? Last uh, three things I want to just uh, mention, what else uh, is relevant to the specific recommendation that uh, you mentioned also for, um, the, 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 for the UN system. Um, on the peace building side, already a group of friends, uh, they, they are forming. Uh, there's going to be soon a group of friends for peace building. Um, for financing, there are, there's already <coughs> internal task force that is led by the Deputy Secretary General to look into innovative ways of financing. Obviously, these financing discussions have to uh, be in, in, uh, synchronized with the largest uh, financing discussions that you talked about in terms of accounts, support accounts. 
Uh, and the member states, of course, member states have to lead this, and they are also starting to look, in fact, into how to implement um, the resolution. Uh, in your recommendation, it was called uh, a member state structure to uh, to uh, devise a roadmap, mm -hmm. and that is uh, also the discussion has started, and uh, it will it will take place at the member state level in the Commission. So I think we are at an exciting time. We are at the right direction, but we need all the help we can get from, from member states, from you, and of course, our, our own system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing a specific example of how some of these recommendations, the paper might be uh, implemented. And thank you for also reminding us what is the end goal of peace building. Is it stabilization or is it to uh, build a sustainable peace? And thank you for also bringing the issue of leadership. Um, uh, we have mentioned in a different way, but the way you presented it, uh, leadership, innovative, courageous leadership to make sustaining peace is a priority of our, uh, our work. And I'm pleased to hear that uh, you are trying also to be people-centered in the way you dispense or at least you, uh, you manage uh, your peace building fund. Thank you for those um, very helpful uh, comment. And without further ado, I now give the floor to Mr. Johnson, who is the, Philip Johnson, the Deputy Permanent Representative of the Permanent Mission of Ghana. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, Yusuf. At the very outset, I'd like to thank the ICM and the IPI for hosting this discussion and for the highly informative discuss, discussion paper on armed conflict, mediation, and peacekeeping. Three as axioms come to mind when I reflect on the topic. And it is not intended to cast any aspersions. But the first one is insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. The second one is prevention is better than cure, but better placed in the words ascribed to Bernard Franklin, an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. And the third one, where there is a will, there is a way. And so if you look at all these three axioms, it tells you clearly that I agree absolutely with the recommendations that have been made. And it's, it is a practical way to move forward. Sustaining peace is critical and indeed fundamental to the very survival of humanity. And hence a collective response of individuals, communities, states, regional organizations, and the United Nations. It is also at the core of the values that the UN stands for. The reason for which the United Nations exists is at stake if it cannot work collectively to maintain international peace and security. This is so, because we cannot talk about human rights and development without peace and security. This is also to emphasize that the discussions that we are having today and those which we've had over uh, a period of months is still relevant, because without peace, we can do nothing. We can't optimize gains in all the agendas of the international uh, system. But the maintenance of international peace and security is the primary responsibility of the Security Council, which acts on behalf of the United Nations to ensure prompt and effective action. I have intended to repeat certain uh, issues raised in the discussion paper for effect. For effect, because we need to keep focus 
on the environment that today's conflicts exist. It is complex. It is rapidly interacting with new variables, such within fragile states, such as violent extremism, organized crime, external funding and military in, in involvement. Non-state actors are involved in these conflicts. And then you have even mercenaries. And these have contributed in making armed conflicts unresponsive to the traditional tools for their settlement. And the situation has also been unduly exacerbated by the huge vested interest and intransigence of actors within the international community, particularly those to whom power is vested to deal with international conflict situations, as well as those at war within states. As clearly stated in the discussion paper, Syria, Iraq, Libya, and other theaters of conflict, including those which we could now term as frozen conflicts, are indeed illustrative. No doubt, in one of such impossible climates, Kofi Annan realized the futility of continuing as UN Arab League mediator in Syria beyond August 2012. And his successor, Mr. Brahimi, remains unable to broker the needed peace to end the conflict. In spite of the slow progress in resolving contemporary armed conflicts due to their difficult nature and environment, the United Nations continues to make useful progress in developing the multilateral architecture for the maintenance of international peace and security. And the speaker just before me had shared some ideas on that. Indeed, the United Nations continues to remain the ideal entity for that enterprise. The establishment of the peace building architecture over a decade ago to seek collective and coherent action to address complex challenges of sustaining peace has been a step in the right direction. We have made more progress in the work of the 2015 review of the UN peace building architecture, which recommends the non-confinement of the work of the PBA to post-conflict situations, but to cover prevention and dismantle the compartmentalization of the peace and security, human rights, and development work of the PBA, while guaranteeing coherence and complementarity in the, in, in the enterprise of maintaining peace and security. Our role is to ensure that these recommendations assume acceptable pathways in sustaining peace in the multilateral setting. The recommendation for the Department of Political Affairs to devise practical programming modalities to help states integrate prevention and mediation for sustaining peace and building resilience is relevant. A model which has proven to be effective and highly supportive in country is the independent Ghana National Peace Council, whose mandate is to develop mechanisms for conflict prevention, management, resolution, and sustainable peace. In our country, this independent body intervenes on issues which could potentially cause conflicts, issues which come from politicians, issues between interstates, uh, ethnic groups, issues between uh, parties, political parties, and issues between tribes, and so on. And they nip those problems in the bud. Even statements that are inflammatory that are made by uh, uh, politicians. 
In addition, the report of the High Level Independent Panel on Peace Operations and the report of the High Level Advisory Group for the Global Study on the Implementation of Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security are also relevant in calling for a contest-based peace operations, a stronger global and regional peace and security partnership, accountability in peace operations. I think I have one minute, but I won't spend that one minute. In closing, it is my hope that we, con we will be able to stimulate strong implementation pathways through the discussions that, we, that will ensue. And also have a stronger relationship between global institutions and regional institutions in dealing with conflicts. And we should make that policy, that a policy, as well as make it practicable. The situation where even certain of agenda in that relationship is detected by the P5 is not encouraging. And when we move forward <coughs> and there is good faith in what we do and we seek collective action and we move away from that vested interest in supporting uh, sections that are involved, involved parties that are involved in conflict, we would have a better world and a better world that would enhance our prosperity. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Philbert. Uh, thank you. Appreciate uh, your comments on the <coughs> recommendations, uh, particularly the ones relating to the role of DPA. I particularly appreciate your giving us an example of the type of infrastructure for peace that Ghana has initiated, and particularly this independent body that you have mentioned that helps ensure that conflict, which is natural, uh, does not transform into, into, into violence. Finally, uh, thank you for reminding us that the P5 and the Security Council in particular has a special responsibility in this uh, particular area. And now I, it's my pleasure to give the floor to my friend and colleague, uh, Tatiana. You have the floor, Tatiana. Thank you very much, uh, Youssef and, and Arthur, for the invitation. And uh, congratulations to the commission. Uh, I think uh, you, you've done a, an incredible job over uh, a, a number of consultations uh, in, uh, in, in what you've, uh, you've produced. And what you've produced, I think, is quite, quite prescient. Um, I've got three points related to the recommendations of uh, the ICM uh, report, this discussion paper, and they're largely looking at lingering uh, challenges. Um, all have implications, I think, for the good, very good recommendations in, in your paper. And uh, some of you won't be surprised that uh, um, I'll echo Arthur's shameless plug for, uh, for the need for research and, uh, and ongoing analysis. Um, the, the three points are really how we think about the context in which we intervene, how we frame the problem. Um, the second is the need to better understand the lived realities of the communities in the places we intervene. And third is the challenges and the ongoing challenges of prevention. So on the first um, point, uh, um, there's a growing recognition among researchers, uh, at least, that we need to be thinking more about how to respond to violence as opposed to responding to armed conflict. We need to understand violence as a distinct phenomenon uh, um, from conflict or, or war. In other words, we need to begin to disaggregate armed conflict and, uh, and, and violence rather than um, the, 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 the way we've been uh, addressing them, which is to, to conflate these two issues. Conflict, uh, as, as my colleague from, from Ghana has mentioned, is endemic in society. What concerns us is the resulting violence. So conflict is not indicative of fragility. Um, it's also not mutually exclusive of development. Um, and you can have widespread grievance and not have violence. So in fact, m much of Africa fits, fits the, 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 the latter. So in most peacekeeping and peacebuilding context today, we see a, a really a variety uh, uh, of types of, of violence. Violence perpetrated by community self-defense groups, political armed groups, rebels, jihadists, criminal syndicates, rioters, and state forces. And even in, uh, in, in Eastern DRC, 
where, where I spend a bit uh, uh, of my time, the 80 plus armed groups, depending on when, when, when you count, uh, presently in operation are not fighting a war. They're extortion or protection rackets and generate uh, enormous rates uh, of, of violence. So peacekeepers especially, but not just, will need a new framing. Uh, precisely to avoid the, the type of militarization of public security um, uh, that, that we've seen uh, in, in some cases, for example, the, the Ebola response or the response to, to drug trafficking in, uh, in, 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 parts of, uh, in parts of Africa. The second point <clears throat> is about the lived realities and better understanding the lived realities of communities in conflict-affected areas. And the HIPPO and the, the, the Peace Building Reviews uh, uh, and, and, uh, and, and this paper rightfully uh, have pointed to the need for peace interventions to be people-focused, people-centered. But what does that mean uh, uh, exactly? So uh, I think rather than come with, um, with preconceived ideas of how, for example, the African state or the, the ex-state should work, we need to pay greater attention to the role of non-state actors in producing local political orders and carrying out governance functions that are traditionally located uh, with, with states. And this is not to privilege uh, the, the local, as, as some have done. I think that would be uh, a mistake. I think one reason violence persists at a local level is because armed groups are embedded within networks that scale up regionally and, and even globally, um, uh, and, and they're embedded in, in, in networks of, of local, national, extranational elites uh, with, with even more influential pa uh, patrons. So, so the local is never truly local. So that, I think, addresses and I think speaks to the, 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 the state-centric problem that we have with a, with a um, uh, state-conceived uh, uh, um, uh, in institution and, uh, and, and toolkit. Um, so um, the, the one, one example of this is that public authority in conflict-affected areas is constantly being shaped and reshaped and renegotiated. And um, it, it, it also helps shape access to two essential public goods, justice and security. So we need to understand whose security is being provided for um, whose justice uh, is being provided for. So there, there are implications um, both for donors and for the UN. Uh, both have to be careful um, that uh, they not just add to the multiplicity of justice and security actors only to exacerbate the problem of forum, sh forum shopping. So you're going to go to the to the actor and to the to the uh, um, uh, to, to the project uh, that's going to deliver you the uh, your your greatest um, returns. That's not uh, um, that's not effective uh, and not effective uh, peace building. So the point here is that we need to better understand the lived realities of these communities, who they turn to for justice and security, rather than develop approaches based on an ideal of the state as provider of public goods. There are others who who do this well. This will require, of course, uh, an investment in in real granular granular understanding uh, and and uh, uh, that that we can get through 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 uh, through solid research, better analysis. And I think a closer relationship with with, um, um, with with research communities. The UN is not a research institution, but you will need to uh, um, uh, connect up with 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 those who who are. On on prevention, I think there's uh, this is the third point. Uh, there's clearly a new appetite for prevention, but. Um, uh, it's almost like Christopher Columbus uh, rediscovering uh, a few things every so often. We periodically rediscover prevention um, in, in and around the, the, the UN. Um, yes, it's cheaper uh, than peace operations or humanitarian uh, interventions, and all of the reviews have emphasized um, prevention. So all parts of the UN will need to take prevention seriously, and it's not just the responsibility of DPA, really, and I think this was an important point by the reviews. Prevention really is, is, um, is the responsibility of the entire UN, uh, UN system. Uh, of course, the idea of preventing conflict isn't new. It was the dominant theme at the Congress of Vienna in 1815, so it's an old idea. Uh, uh, it's uh, also a central feature of the UN Charter, um, uh, but there are a number of challenges that still need to be addressed for us to have a successful prevention agenda so that we're not here again in 15 years with another set of reports announcing the need for prevention. The first challenge, um, uh, and I think the biggest challenge that will need to be addressed uh, by, by, uh, by um, a subsequent uh, SG, and, and I think all of us, um, uh, is, is the lack of conceptual clarity. While we've all come to accept, it's broadly accepted, uh, that uh, that uh, preventing conflict is uh, is important. Um, 
both scholars and policymakers still struggle with conceptual and policy uh, issues. It, conflict prevention means different things to different people. There's really no agreed upon definition. And, and I, I'm calling out both research communities and, and decision makers in, in the UN because I think it's a, it's a twin problem that reinforces uh, itself and has made prevention really difficult to operationalize um, for our UN colleagues. And we've seen successive um, UN secretaries general have really sought to define and, and redefine pr prevention, especially in the context of humanitarianism. You know, the term preventive diplomacy was first coined in 1960 by Dag Hammarskjöld, and then we saw Boutros Ghali uh, in 92 in, uh, uh, address it in his Agenda for Peace. Kofi Annan did much to pr uh, advance the idea of, 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 of prevention uh, and, and try to build what he called the culture of prevention uh, um, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, 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 in the UN. The, the, the a new SG will have to, to, to take on the same challenge of, of defining uh, uh, the, the, this, this conceptual definitional problem. Um, so the, the debates around prevention, uh, as many of you know, focus on really two ways of understanding prevention. And this comes out of the Carnegie Commission of Deadly Conflict. One is operational direct prevention. Uh, that's the prompt short-term interventions to avoid the potential escalation of a dispute. Uh, to violent conflict, it's a big focus on preventive diplomacy. And the second is structural uh, prevention. This is a more long-term uh, uh, focus on, uh, on the underlying uh, causes of, 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 of conflict. So in other words, should conflict prevention address only the immediate causes of conflict, or also its underlying roots, or both? We'll need leadership to get beyond the debates uh, uh, around this. Um, a, a second challenge of, of prevention um, is the is the Increasing in recent years, merging of prevention and protection uh, agendas, especially since um, the International Commission on State Sovereignty and Intervention (R2P), I think those two agendas have 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 merged, and um, we'll need to better explain both the differences and the linkages and the relationships between these two agendas. The third um, and, and final challenge of prevention um, is the it's a new challenge for us uh, is the changing nature of violence. And, and in particular PVE, um, uh, what exactly are we preventing? Uh, and what exactly should we be trying to prevent? So um, the, the, the truth of the matter is that the, the prevention debates and definitions are really captive to the policy debates of the day. And politics will always constrain um, uh, uh, how much uh, and what we can do around uh, prevention. But I'll end on a, on a positive note. And I think on, on the plus side, um, there are a number of new technologies that offer new promise for smarter, cost-effective uh, prevention. And <clears throat> last night, I, I heard a news story that the um, US government uh, missile defense system is still run on uh, an eight-inch uh, floppy disks and generation one IBM computers circa 1970. So on this front, with very, very little effort uh, and a little bit of innovation, the UN could really be cutting edge uh, in, in comparison. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tatiana. And thank you for um, reminding us uh, of the necessity to analyze the problem properly, um, certainly from the eyes of those who are at the receiving end and the local reality. Also, thank you for reminding us of the need to work. Still, there is a lot of work on the conceptual and policy clarity with respect to prevention, so we don't periodically uh, continue to sing its virtues uh, every so often without much movement. So I'd like now to open uh, the floor um, and uh, for uh, your thoughts, your views uh, on the recommendations. So I have one person here. If you could bring the microphone to the. Uh, hello. My question is, um, should I have a couple of questions that are interrelated? Sorry, Shamina de Gonzaga, World Council of Peoples for the United Nations, uh, an NGO. So um, in what you just said with regard to understanding lived realities and working with research communities, I was hoping you could expand a little bit on what you mean by research communities. Is this all outside-based think tank approaches, or how do you actually work with local actors that might not have the same kind of language and knowledge of these processes that is being discussed here? Uh, in connection with that, the shameless plug point, I, mean, I, I value the 
the reports and the studies, but when you reference the plethora of recommendations that already exist, I think from the outside it can seem like the ongoing analysis can sometimes take the place of an action. So how do you stay focused to actually keep on track and not just create more and more reports and summits uh, as a means of moving forward? And the last was on your um, recommendation 4E about exploring tensions. I feel like that kind of language is not really useful. Um, and I'm hoping you could elaborate a little bit on what you mean and perhaps be more concrete, especially if you're going to be doing summaries of recommendations. Thank you. Thoughts? Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Kai Stabel with uh, C4CCR. I'm happy to see this leadership issue come back, which is one of my big hobby horses for those who've had to endure me in the past. Uh, I just want to ask back to how do you, as the Peace Building Commission, see uh, a more rapid way of being able to retract RCs, SRSGs? Like, what kind of a time span could we move towards if we look back to how the, the US and others during the Second World War were able to call back generals on day one, day two, if they didn't complete? Like, if we're serious about this peace building effort, how, how, how can we truly address that leadership we need? Because a lot of the points that are being made are not able to be executed if we don't have the leadership that's needed. And I think too often we get sort of wiggled in. So I just want to know how the Peace Building Commission and others see a more rapid way of being able to interchange. Thank you. Um, microphone here for um, Adam. Hi, Adam Lupel from IPI and the ICM. Uh, so in some sense, this is a question for myself, but really it's also uh, um, to try to get some more from, uh, from the public, because it's a public consultation, and, and response in some sense to that first question. Arthur uh, mentioned that this, uh, this exercise is following up on 300 uh, recommendations, and I'm very conscious of that as, as we move forward to the, uh, uh, producing the final report for the ICM. And uh, we're, we, it's something we've been thinking quite a bit about, um, <coughs> that the timing of, of this following up what has been an extraordinary period of, uh, of, of activity in the system and, and evaluation and recommendations and such. Um, and so we don't want to just sort of tack on a whole bunch of other new recommendations necessarily that, that are uh, um, apart from that process. We're looking to build upon what has been happening and, and, and uh, move the process forward. Um, and uh, uh, my, my question then is, Recognizing all this wealth of activity, obviously there's going to be have to be some uh, focusing prioritization um, uh, when we move as we move towards implementation of actually making things happen. Um, and so, uh, as we have this panel here, I'm interested. Uh, yes, uh, from my, my colleagues, but also from the member state perspective, from Ambassador Johnson and from uh, uh, um, from the PPSO and such. We know that when the next SG comes in, there's always sort of a window of opportunity uh, when real uh, proposals can be made and there can be some sort of uh, capital in which to move things forward. Uh, if you could have a wish list of sort of top three priorities uh, in that first window of uh, time of the next SG, what would they be? Thank you, Adam. Um, if I don't see any hands competing, I will uh, one last, and then yes, please, sir. Oh, cool. thank you, Ben Piven, uh, formerly with Al Jazeera America. Um, my question is about the international system, and um, one of the main observations in this report seems to be that. Um, non-state actors such as Daesh, um, other groups, uh, whether terrorist or otherwise, uh, don't themselves recognize this international system. And so when you're trying to come up with a framework for engaging such groups, uh, I'm just wondering how exactly that's possible when uh, many of them do in fact pose an existential threat to the system. And so when many countries um, and uh, super governments, mental institutions don't accept any sort of formal communication uh, with quote-unquote terrorist groups, 
Uh, how exactly do you come to terms with that at the end of the day in establishing a framework when they exist sort of beyond or outside of that framework? Thank you very much. I'm conscious this is not the usual panel where we are the experts and then we answer back, so I want to get as many comments as possible on the paper. So before I come back to the panel, if you, if you have any other thoughts or comments on the paper or the recommendations, maybe we'll come back. So I'd like perhaps uh, to ask Arthur to address this uh, issue of, of, of tension, um, but also both Arthur and Tatiana, how do you strike a balance between research and action? Um, and um, Marit, if you, um, Marit, if you could um, address the issue of leadership uh, that was uh, asked. Um, and uh, um, Mr. Johnson, uh, Philbert, if you could um, put yourself as the next Secretary General, you may be the wrong gender, but um, um, <laughs> what would be your first three priorities that you would focus on um, uh, almost immediately? Um, on the um, on the issue of um, how to engage with non-state actors who don't recognize this state-centric framework, in fact, you're almost prohibited in some circumstances from dealing with them. We'll see who is going to jump first uh, from my colleagues yeah. to address th that important question. Thank you, Arthur. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for the for the question. So maybe starting with uh, with Shamin's uh, uh, question, um, absolutely, and and uh, agreed. And and uh, as Adam uh, also emphasized, uh, there's a real question with so much work having been done and so much research having fed into the reviews themselves and the recommendations that came out of it. Uh, there's a real need for uh, for implementation. Uh, and indeed, some of the recommendations are pretty concrete and haven't been have been taken up by the Secretary General and have been acted upon. Uh, well, for instance, you know the, the creation of the analysis and planning cell within EOSG. Uh, that clearly was a recommendation that came out of research that was picked up in the HIPO and in the ESG report. Uh, so there are some recommendations that are pretty concrete and can be acted upon either by the Secretary or can be supported by member member states. However, as we've been working. Uh, uh, this past year on, on looking at how to implement uh, these reviews, and particularly the, the HIPO uh, recommendations, one of the things we've heard uh, again and again is that member states are looking for specific recommendations to champion. Uh, however, they feel sometimes they're not specific enough and practical enough, uh, and they wish that sometimes the, the secretary or the research community would also help them uh, uh, zoom in and, and sort of turn uh, broad recommendation into more practical ones. Uh, and this is typically uh, the people-centered uh, recommendation uh, of the HIPPO. Uh, it sounds like a good recommendation, right? Uh, but it's not easy to think practically how that would look, uh, especially when you have a peacekeeping model that is very state-centric, uh, still a very country specific rather than across borders uh, that is dependent on the uh, consent of the host uh, country, host government as well. Uh, so that's why this, and, and you know, right now you would ask, uh, if you ask maybe some of the people in the Secretariat, okay, what are you doing to do to make it people-centered? Uh, well, they'll say, oh, we're doing this in, in the Congo and we have community liaison assistance, right? We have the radio and all this. And, but th this is not what people-centered, and that links to what Tatiana uh, is saying this is just a way to try to communicate better, right? And this is this is important, uh, and this is something that is recognized. Uh, but there's really also a need for better understanding and factoring in local voices in every stage of the process, including in uh, what Tatiana called granular analysis. There's definitely a need for for better understanding uh, the armed groups, uh, for better understanding this, the the causes of, of violence. Uh, we do indeed throw. Uh, military solutions, peacekeepers, to problems that are sometimes criminal or, or others. Uh, so there's a need for, for thinking of this. Uh, we see now in Mali the UN is becoming the target uh, of asymmetric attacks. 
there's a real need for thinking about this. What does that mean? Uh, uh, reflecting on the broader heading of of of, uh, uh, of people uh, people centered, I think, uh, and um, in terms of um, balancing research and action, uh, that's uh, <laughs> uh, again, I think I think everybody has a part to play uh, uh, in this. Uh, uh, here at IPI, we try to think of ourselves as do tank. Uh, so not only doing research, but also trying to move forward the policies through some convening. Uh, we also, uh, but I think uh, for the sake of the system, uh, whether the, the peace operation side or the peace building side, uh, there's a real need also for building more on partnerships indeed. Uh, the system cannot do uh, everything itself, cannot do uh, you know, cannot necessarily access the, the local voices itself. And a lot of you, the, the NGO communities, have uh, local partners have uh, people on the ground, and this analysis should be able to feed better uh, into the analysis and planning processes of the UN. Um, just, uh, and I'll, I'll dovetail, my comments will dovetail uh, uh, quite quite well with um, uh, with Arthur's. Um, a lot of the, the I mean, it's not for a lack of knowledge um, very often. Uh, we, we, we often know, or at least someone knows what's happening at a, at, a, at a fairly granular level. We're not suggesting the UN should become a research institution, but it is a consumer of, of, of research. Um, I know because that's how we also work with our, with our UN colleagues. So it's, it's, it's um, what, what sometimes is is um, is missing again is not uh, uh, knowledge of what's happening, but how to get from point A to, to point B, and that's you know there's the there's the Security Council um, uh, uh, politics. There's uh, when do you run things up the food chain in uh, in inside the system. Uh, it's it's how do you utilize the 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 the, the existing knowledge. At what points in the system uh, uh, to um, uh, to to uh, to affect to affect change? I think there's 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 some work that can be done within 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 the secretariat on this issue. And I think the planning and analysis cell um, has been thinking about how to more effectively know when to access what at at uh, at what time. So and and again, partnerships is, is is crucial to that. But just on the point of NGOs, I mean there there is a um, I mean. The, there's a number of us doing research, and we we have partners in in these regions, uh, local researchers, and so on. But NGOs, uh, especially with with field presences, have a particular uh, a particularly different take, and 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 you plug into different networks. When I started coming around First Avenue uh, a thousand years ago, there were NGO working groups on particular issues. I don't see that anymore. I don't see that on particular crises. Uh, we had you know, NGO working groups on northern Uganda, with NGO, and they were really, really very important to feeding in um, um, knowledge from, from uh, uh, alternative voices, even from the research communities and the think tanks, into, into the system at, at, in, at, at very key moments. So I would urge you all to, to go out and organize. That's, uh. Thank you very much. Mr. Philbert, would you like to put on your SG hat? Well, this is a very difficult question, and I must admit I'm not uh, that ambitious, even though if it's given to me on a silver platter, I'll take it. You know, the reality is the paralysis of the uh, Security Council, and if one could give some incentive to the P5 to work towards the collective interests of the system, but in reality, that incentive is difficult to give. And so, in my view, then, you'd have to revitalize the system to work effectively so that decisions are either not blocked by the uh, P5 or taken in the interest of the P5 alone. You know, and that is a very critical thing that the Secretary General would have to find a way to get it done. Now, the PBA is a good initiative. Uh, yeah, and uh, it's been used not only uh, uh, for a parochial, how do you call it, uh, objective, but 
it looks at issues broadly. Countries themselves could come and say that, I have this problem, could you help? And in Guinea-Bissau, even though it's not a good example to give, the PBA did extensively, uh, extensive work to stabilize the situation, except for poor leadership in that country, you know? And so it's a difficult, uh, uh, how do you call it, uh, fun to do. But then gradually, incrementally, if we could uh, give an incentive for those to whom power is vested, to maintain international peace and security, to do what they ought to do, it would help. And uh, if we have a secretary general, p pardon me if you don't like him, like Doug Hammarskjöld, you should speak out. You should say what it is and don't be part of the politics because you have a, a job to do. Now, let me uh, just use an axiom. The devil finds work for idle hands. You know, in Africa, you realize that the population of young people is growing and in the Middle East and so on. If those young people continue to be without work, to be without the basic necessities of life, whilst others, that imbalance, what we call social justice, we do not work on that in the international community, we would find nothing better than we are finding today. So you would put that as a priority, one of I the priorities for the it, SG? It, it is a priority. Thank it you. A priority. Thank, Thank you very you. much. The easiest question. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. If I understood correctly, you, you used the word re retracting. So I, 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 if I understood the correct, uh, question correctly, you're asking how can we quickly uh, recall. recall or take away non-performing leaders on the ground? So that's a valid question. Um, but before we recall, I think we need to make sure that, who, that our leaders on the ground actually have all the support that they need uh, institutionally and politically from the headquarters, in this case, from the institutions, uh, so that they can do and take the political risks they need to do sometimes, being uh, even representative on the ground, uh, and being challenged, let's say, by governments or others uh, who say you don't have the mandate to do what you're doing. So I think that's the more important first point, that that support and, and the en enabling <clears throat> environment exists. The second uh, important point is that of course, the host, the host country's environment has to also be enabling. So we have to make sure that when our leaders go into these countries, be it through a Security Council mandate or through a mandate of our organizations and agreement with the country, if the fundamental environment is not supportive of the work to do, then we, we need to address that also. We need to work with the government at the political level. We need to work with them at the local level. We need to work with those elements that uh, challenge the UN or international community support. So I think those are actually more important things that needs to be consciously strengthened from, from, the, from the UN side in this case. But if uh, they are not performing, I think there, there, are, there have been precedents in terms of the Secretary General recalling or uh, um, basically um, ending, ending the, the contracts of his, their special representatives. And so I think we do have that, that, that requires that kind of political decision too, based on, on good reasons. But again, um, the flip side of it is, all, is also, we also have to make sure that when these political appointments happen, especially at the high level, that the UN is not being pushed people by member states for the wrong reasons, so that uh, it, it's, a, it's a sort of two or three-sided uh, picture in terms of recalling. Thank you. Do I see you threatening with two fingers? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, briefly. It just goes back to, it's, it's a given that the apparatus needs to be strengthened. The, the, the RC needs to, to be able to perform in a role, and Mahmoud knows very well the demanding structures that that kind of a job Entitles, uh, entails, but that aside, uh, so much depends on leadership in these situations and that ability to unite or that ability to, to, to engage and look for those opportunities because what Johnson was, says, was saying is, what would you think? And I'm thinking, it's a circle, it's Euclid, it's Earth. What is the incentive? It's, it's that common goal. And I think we have to 
remember that we've become somehow overeducated how in the past we were undereducated. And after the First World War, the, the numbers 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 was chosen. And I'm not a crazy person, but I can see how that was chosen for making it easy for people to remember when it happened. And I'm wondering, like, how can we transition it? And how can we, in this society, again, find those kind of leaders, find those kind of people that can motivate and get the organizations to work as one? Because if not, the UN is no longer embodying the charter. And it's obvious. I think there are uh, two trends that might comfort you in terms of leadership at the United Nations. Uh, I wish I had enjoyed them when I was in the field. One is that we're talking more and more about mission leadership. So it is not the top person where everything rests. Second, those who are being appointed are encouraged as part of their job to identify and unleash the leadership potential at all levels. So the decision making not, do not always go to the top of the pyramid. In fact, the pyramid is more and more flattened. It's going to take time. That's why we have specific recommendations there about the way we attract, develop, um, uh, and, and, and evaluate the performance of the person. And this is one of the requirements. Uh, so hopefully, uh, we will not be in an army where you can call and recall. This is much more complex. Uh, and that complexity is finally finding its way in the selection uh, process. Um, you will have one question here. And then I'll come back to the non-state actors. I have not forgotten for um, else. Thank you. Hi, uh, Elsdebeuf, also with the ICM and, and IPI. Building on, on some of what was said about the, the leadership and, and the resident coordinator, uh, and seeing the point of having a, a coherent and a holistic approach. But still, if we think that these resident coordinators should take on peace building uh, issues, usually lead the development system in the country, and more often than not also are in charge of humanitarian coordination. And in a way, these areas of work require very different skills and backgrounds in order to be able to lead on them. Uh, so I'm just wondering as well, are we not asking too much of them? And then taking it to what you said, Yusuf, about unleashing leadership elsewhere. Shouldn't it be a team sh rather than one person? In ch I mean, you could have a person on top to have the, the cohesive holistic approach and making choices on when do we put what track, uh, priori prioritize it. But shouldn't there be a team around that? Because asking from a, a resident coordinator to tackle these three very broad agendas, very different agendas, I think that's a bit much. There is, there is, there is room for one more question before I turn it back to the, yes, please. Thank you. I'm Nadir with the Global Center for the Responsibility to Protect. And just very briefly, if you could comment, any of the panelists, on the Human Rights Upfront initiative and how it all ties with uh, the questions that were raised. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, it looks like um, you are the candidate for giving it uh, a first try uh, with respect to the RC, Marie. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and maybe even uh, uh, do your best with the right. human rights up front. Thank you. Um, it's, it's really a fair question. Are we asking too much of our leaders, uh, the ones that are sent into different countries on behalf of the United Nations? And I, I think it is a very challenging job, for sure. Um, but the, the kind of challenges we're talking about here uh, are quite specific. So we have resident coordinators, I think, in 150 or so countries. And not all 150 countries need uh, or, or face the same challenge. So really, uh, what we're talking about is uh, countries in transition, countries with uh, co complex uh, backgrounds, uh, com uh, complex uh, environment. And for those, I think it, it's actually not too much to ask. We have a cadre of UN uh, leaders that have gone through, uh, you're right, they have gone through perhaps as development professionals or peace professionals or humanitarian professionals. And we are now at a time when we are transitioning into an approach where we have to take it all into account and we have to prioritize some of the uh, issues that confront us. And for each issue, we need different skill sets. So it, it is a time where leaders are required different skill sets, but they are also required to tap into other expertise. 
Um, so it, it, it is a lot to ask. I don't think it's too much to ask. After all, we, we are privileged to work in an environment and we are given tools, um, perhaps not enough, but I think uh, it, it, is, it is correct. But I do agree that indeed it has to be a collective leadership also. So you do have, I mean, at the end, at the end of the day, of course, there's always one person who is the leader, but that person can never achieve anything unless you tap into the collective uh, leadership of various experts, or be it agencies or other, the humanitarians or the development or the, the, the political. So the question is, how do we structure ourselves to do that? And again, I, I do want to emphasize that we need that political will also, because in most countries where the resident coordinators are, there is a very clear understanding, memor I mean, there's a clear framework within the, which they work. And of course, over the years, we are trying to, through in the dialogue with member states, uh, to uh, to have member states agree that indeed, even if we talk about development, it is not that linear, and there are m many elements, and that's still a contentious discussion, um, which which will continue. You know, how how do we define uh, sustaining peace in a particular country, and what's the role of the UN? So the challenge is great. I think we we need uh, we need all the support, but uh, I think it it can be done. Uh, anyone would like to take the human rights up front? Or you want to communicate, uh, continue on this? Yeah, please go ahead. No, just a word on this. I mean, uh, I mean, we could. There is so much to uh, uh, to say, and and uh, uh, I'm conscious I'm, I'm sitting <laughs> at the table with <laughs> my former boss, who was also the executive representative of the Secretary General in Burundi, and had the the dual hat of being the head of mission and also the RCHC, uh, uh, a model that. Uh, unfortunately, has been abandoned uh, since. But maybe what I say is that oh. one of the problem, <laughs> one I of the I closed it. <laughs> <laughs> one of the pro one of the things we should be mindful also in, in leadership selection is not reproducing the silos uh, of the UN. For some years already, the now the RC exams is opened uh, to a few uh, people with uh, different backgrounds who may have been DPA or, or DPQ. And I think that's a that's definitely a positive thing, but. I mean, peace building is a collective responsibility of mission leadership. Uh, so the, the SRG should not be the political or, or the, the SRG political, the political and the RCHC, the development person. Uh, I mean, I think it is important that we have SRGs that are uh, development experts and human rights experts. And, and conversely, uh, we need RCs, uh, whether in a mission setting or non-mission settings, that are much more political. Uh, of course. You know, there are fixes, uh, which we call connectors in our, in our synergies papers, like the Peace and Development Advisors. Uh, and these are, are positive evolutions of the system trying to fix uh, some of these, right? Bringing some of the politics and, and peace building, uh, political aspects of peace building into the, uh, the development world. Uh, but I think that's not enough. There needs to be many more crossovers uh, throughout the careers. Uh, you can't have people that are just experts in one domain and, and rising throughout. I mean, peace building is eminently political, uh, and, and that, that just needs to be uh, recognized. Of course, the challenge in selecting leadership team that combine all of this and combine also the expertise with the managerial skills, uh, combine the, uh, the UN experience with the outside non-UN experience, that's the big challenge because oftentimes we know that uh, it's difficult to recruit, and that's the the idea is excellent of leadership team. And uh, the former head of FPD, uh, Fabrizio Olcha, was championing it. Yet, it's been very difficult to put into practice because rarely do you recruit all your leadership team at the same time. Uh, I mean, that's just one of the uh, the challenges, of course. Anyone would like to take up the um, right up front? No, no. no. Okay. Uh, your question seems to be too difficult, but. Uh, I would want to add to what he just said. You know, when you're given an impossible task, you would not be able to perform. Kofi Annan could have done well in uh, Syria. Brahimi would have solved the problem, but it's an impossible task. I have seen RCs working. I've been to Madagascar, seen the RC working with the team. Namibia, I've seen them work. And in my own country, Ghana, they are fantastic. They know what they are about. And so there are situations where it is just impracticable and quite difficult to do it. And uh, you cannot blame the RC. Thank you. Thank you. Just uh, quickly, be mindful of time, just to add on the, on the RC uh, and leadership question, um, we need to value uh, leaders who <clears throat> 
are PNG'd rather than shun them. I think uh, it's probably heretical to, to say, uh, but um, if, if the system doesn't value uh, leaders who speak out on principle and are willing uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to sacrifice their, and, and get kicked out of country, um, uh, then it becomes that much more difficult to get the kind of leadership that uh, that that uh, that you're um, that, that you're that you're talking about. Just quickly on human rights up front, um, it's been one of the most effective tools of trying to mainstream human rights um, throughout the system. It's been used quite effectively to to, to drive responses uh, in uh, in in places like CAR and 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 uh, and, and and elsewhere. Um, it's um, it's something that we all need to collectively watch uh, that we don't lose it. It's a it's a it's a very very critical tool that, uh, um, when used effectively, uh, can get around some of the the, the blockages and response that uh, that we often run into. Um, so it's it's in this, if if we are all, if we're serious about ma mainstreaming prevention as well across the system. Uh, uh, we need to preserve the, the human rights up front uh, 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 initiative. So, please go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, I, I forgot about the human rights up front. It wasn't that I didn't want to address it. I think it's a. It, thank you for the question, and also thank you, Tatiana. I think you said it. Um, the way it really has been mainstreamed is not only by at the highest level, Deputy Secretary General, Secretary General, really, really, really hammering it in. I mean, this is, has been a at least a year-long sort of repeated mantra almost uh, to all of us in the UN system, but also uh, all of our colleagues in the field. So I, I would agree it has it has been mainstreamed. Now, how do you operationalize it, and what does it really mean then for us? And it means many, many things, but it means actually also it has served to break some of the silos. Um, as incredible as it sounds, we, we are a huge system, and even though we speak always in one voice, internally the, the divisions are still there. And uh, human rights up front, uh, first and foremost, was that. It, it brought the system together. It brought, of course, the human rights voice closer to the core when sometimes it was not there. Uh, so that helped. And, and of course, human rights as a, as a principle, as a norm, is mainstreamed in everybody's activities. But the fact that we were, as a system, asked to do a little bit of a, a bit, bit better working together. So you do a quarterly review, and within the system, system with, from all the angles and we agree, so where are the hotspots and where are the areas that we watch and what is the human rights angle? Is it something that we can address at, at the country level? Do you need more support from the, from the headquarter level or does it even need to be elevated at the higher political level? There are many, many tools and it has provided a forum where these tools can be discussed collectively and it has also helped in terms of sequencing, for example, it is not always just that you, you speak out on human rights in the public. That's not the only tool. There are many, many other ways of influence and impacting human rights issues. And it gave us, uh, it forced us with a platform to actually address it and sort of prioritize the, the ways in which we address. So I think that's, that's important and the breaking of silos is something that came together. Thanks. Thank you very much. We have three minutes, no more than three minutes. And we have one more question that we did not answer, which is how to engage with non-state actors, particularly the armed among them and the terrorists among them, and how to make the state-centric um, approaches uh, for mediation fit uh, a particular stakeholder that um, whose position do not necessarily uh, are conducive to third-party mediation. In fact, they are so extremes, um, not sure the word mediation would be appropriate, and yet it's a reality. So how anyone would like to um, let me just throw to three, because the time, uh, uh, we address it in the paper, and in fact, that's why we have one recommendation addressed to DPA. Um, in the paper, it says that we need to know the worldview of these stakeholders, and doesn't mean necessarily the United Nations. There are so many other actors on the ground, uh, particularly track two, who have access to these people and therefore could convey their... Um... Second, many local people have access to those actors and have views of how and what their worldview is. 
Three, the Secretary General, when he took, um, when he commented on the HIPPO report, he says in mediation, no one should be excluded. The, the inclusion um, um, principle has been um, um, stressed in his, um, in, his, uh, in his report. Now, it's the modality and the context that's going to dictate the type of approach for gaining uh, access to the worldview and the needs and the motivation of these stakeholders so as to avoid time passing and destruction and violence. All of a sudden, remember, like we're doing with the Taliban, oh, we should have talked about them. So there is a recognition of the limitations of proscriptions that because they happen to be on a, on a, on a sanction list. Or, uh, so there is an awareness. I'm not sure it has developed into practical policy engagement at the track one level, intergovernmental level, but it's certainly making its way uh, at various other uh, uh, levels. Anyone would like to add uh, one, one word, one sentence uh, on this? Just that we used to not talk to rebel groups, saw them as spoilers, and that evolved. I think this is going to evolve as well, and is evolving. Yeah. That brings us to an end. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking the panel. <laughs>